Father everlasting, the all creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Ever living God, author of creation, we give you thanks for your gift of water that brings life and refreshes the earth. We bless and praise you for by water and the word we are cleansed from sin and receive everlasting life. Join us again this day to the saving death of Christ. Renew in us the living foundation of your grace and raise us with Christ Jesus to live in newness of life. For you are merciful 
and you love your whole creation. And with all your creatures, we give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, who gives us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and, and also with, with you. you. Today, I'm fortunate to introduce to you Chaplain Michelle. Chaplain Michelle is studying to become a deacon in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Deacons are ordained into word and service. She's a student at LSTC, where Pastor Michaela and Pastor Jacob graduated from. We welcome her warmly. We give thanks for her and for her ministry in our midst. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without you nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Embrace us with your mercy, that you be with you as our ruler and guide. We may live through what is temporary without losing what is eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When some were speaking about the temple and how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, For these things that you see, the day will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And Jesus said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am the one, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end will not follow immediately. Then Jesus said to them, Nation will rise against nation and country against country. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before rulers and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and family, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, uh, being that I am a person with very little hair, I am glad to hear that not a hair on my head will perish because, well, as you can see, um, I haven't got much to perish. But 
seriously, though. Jesus talks about these great signs and these things that are going on, and, and the people are asking about signs. What is going to happen? How will we know when the temple will be destroyed? How will we know when our place of worship will come to an end? Truth be told, throughout all of history, there have been many folks that have wanted to have clear-cut answers, easy answers for when things are going to occur. All of us want to be able to plan ahead, and yet Jesus in the gospel tells us to be careful not to plan for our defenses. Because when we have to offer up who we are as children of God, the Holy Spirit will be able to do that for us. I wonder, if I can be honest, siblings in Christ, I wonder if we ourselves might be curious about which of our temples might have stones cast down from. I wonder, siblings in Christ, if some of us may be a little overly preoccupied with the nature of our temples than we are about how we're called to be faithful. In Jesus' time, his disciples and, and all whom he knew had been waiting and watching and, and for generations to see the completion of the temple in Jerusalem. By the time Jesus is born, the temple itself has been under construction for over 500, nearly 600 years. This second temple that Jesus and his disciples knew well was still a work in progress. It makes me think about the larger church, and I don't mean our individual church buildings, but the entirety of the church throughout the world, how it too is a continuous work in progress. In fact, it's interesting to me that it seems like every 300 to 500 years, the church goes through a radical re-understanding of, of who it is and how it functions. In the mid to late 300s, the Nicene Creed helped us understand what it meant to be a people of God that understood God in Trinity and in unity. Shortly thereafter, there was, of course, the Great Schism. The East and the West Church pulling apart. In the 1500s, the Reformation, the Protestants, and the Catholics. You know, it's been over 500 years, folks. If some of us are wondering what is going on within our congregations and within the church as a whole. Well, goodness gracious, some of those stones are starting to tumble. But that isn't a bad thing. The destructions of our temples helps us think about what truly matters. It doesn't mean that it's not something that we can mourn about. It doesn't mean that it's something that we pass by or ignore, but it means that the faith endures even when the structures start to fall apart. I think it's particularly important for us to hold on to this message when we are thinking about those folks who are affirming their faith or have recently affirmed their faith, our confirmation students between the congregations that gather for worship. These young persons who are growing into young adults are developing a faith and nurturing a faith that is quite different than the ones that have come before. They're going to be facing challenges and realities that none of us have experienced before. And witnessing a time where things are so different than any time we could ever remember, they are developing gifts and skills that uniquely give them the ability to share the good news in ways that you and I may never have had. And even though it may seem like our world is forever different than it once was and, and that our way of understanding how this world interacts with itself is so different than it once was, there is a blessing. 
There is a blessing in that as the old ways start to fade away and as the things that we once expected to always be the case start to shift, that new ways of sharing the same story of faith will emerge. That the gospel itself, the story, the good news of Jesus Christ will continue to flourish and survive and thrive even though you and I will age, even though the temples we've built around ourselves will age and eventually crumble. The good news endures. And yeah, we may be looking for times and examples and things to point to, to say, yeah, it's coming soon. Yes, the end is in sight. Jesus reminds us that those voices aren't the ones that we need to be putting energy toward. Rather, what we need to be putting energy toward is living faithfully. And we do that by sharing the good news. We do that by reaching out in love and care and genuine support of one another, rather than focusing on the structures of what have been. The relationship of the faithful is what Jesus is talking about. Do not be led astray by those who want to control you or manipulate you or lead you into their own desires, but rather attest to Christ. And that's what we do when we gather, isn't it? We share the good news of Jesus Christ. We gather in various places, whether it's in our homes or in communities of faith in church houses. And yet the church transcends all of that. Just like the welcome to the Lord's table transcends all of that. Through God's word and through holy meal, we are united as one people of God throughout time, throughout space, to be about the building up of God's heavenly kingdom rather than our earthly domains. So let us, let us take reassurance in what God is doing in this time and how we, you, me, and all the others of faith throughout this world are members of that heavenly body that knows no end but only, only the opportunity for yet another new beginning. Thanks be to God. Amen. was there to hear your boarding cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. I was there when you were but a child with a faith to suit you well.
under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third, On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and, and the, the life, life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. United with your saints across time and place, we pray for our shared world. Reviving God, keep your church active in its mission and ministry. Encourage bishops, deacons, pastors, and lay leaders to risk boldly in their proclamation and fill them with wisdom and endurance for challenging times. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Renewing God, as the Northern Hemisphere prepares for winter, make us mindful of the ordered beauty of your creation. Teach us to treasure cycles of rest and new life. Help us care for what you have made. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Loving God, accompany all who make sacrifices for the sake of others. Safeguard first responders and active duty military personnel. Grant peace to veterans and heal any wounds in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Healing God, your people cry out to you. Sustain doctors, nurses, and hospital personnel in their tireless work. Uphold mental health professionals and those in their care. May the sun of righteousness rise on all who are sick. Lord, in your mercy, Receive our prayer. Consoling God, abide with all who grieve for loved ones who have died. Comfort us with the promise of resurrection and new life with you. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Accept these prayers, gracious God, and those known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, surrounded by evil and bordered by death, we appeal to you, our sovereign, our wisdom, and our judge. We praise you for Christ who proclaimed your reign of peace and promised an end to injustice and harm. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, the sacrifice of his life and death, in the victory of his resurrection, we await with all the saints his loving redemption of our suffering world. Send your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine and on all who share in the body and blood of your Son. Teach us your mercy and justice and make all things new in Christ. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church both now and forever. Amen. Our Father, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ spreads a table before you. Gather here with all of the saints. We give you thanks, most gracious God, that you have fed us with the bread of heaven and given us a foretaste of paradise. Enliven us to be your body in the world and to serve those who are in need through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The God of peace, who creates all things and calls them good, who makes us alive in Jesus and who breathes on us the spirit of hope. Bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, be a blessing to the world. Thanks be to God.
Thank <laughs> you.